Tonight, the RCMP offers to pull back on Wet'suwet'en territory. Is that enough to break the impasse of protests across the country? We have now met the conditions that were set. At issue, looks at the government's response. Canadians stuck on a cruise ship are on their way home to more quarantine. This packaging actually has a lot of red flags. For online shoppers on big name sites, it's still buyer beware. And the violinist, the brain tumor, and the musical surgeon. When a patient shows you a challenge like that. Removing a tumor to a tomb. This is The National. After two weeks of protests, rail blockades and flaring tempers, the RCMP has made an offer to ease tensions and perhaps get trains rolling again. It says it will leave its position near protesters on Wet'suwet'en territory in B.C. The government hopes that could open the door to a meeting with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs who oppose a pipeline plan through their territory. But so far, they've made no public response. You see, the hereditary chiefs have been refusing to meet until the RCMP actually leaves Wet'suwet'en territory. But the RCMP's offer to pull back depends on the road to the construction site being clear of protesters. Here's what Greg Rasmussen found when he drove that road today. At the heart of this dispute is this 70-kilometer-long logging road. We drove the icy, sometimes hazardous route today at one point having to break to avoid a pair of moose. We also saw several RCMP vehicles on patrol. These officers stopped to see what we were doing. We're with CBC News. Okay. So we're just so heading up the road to see what's going on. Okay, just so you know you're also being reported. Okay. We asked if they had orders to leave. And are you guys pulling out? We've heard that the RCMP are pulling out all the way back to... Thank you know as well as I do that I have no comment on that. As we continued down the road through thick forests, we came across some of the structures built by pipeline opponents. So today this camp is looking pretty abandoned still. At three other locations cleared out by the RCMP, pipeline opponents have returned, including some who were arrested recently. They asked not to be filmed and declined to talk to us. This bridge is near the end of the road. It's where Coastal GasLink wants to build its pipeline, and it's also on the land and water the Wet'suwet'en claim as their own. This RCMP outpost along the road is a key sticking point. In a letter to the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs, the RCMP offered to dismantle it, saying, we are therefore prepared to conduct policing operations from Houston detachment. In order for those discussions to happen, we have to not be under duress. The hereditary chiefs say they don't trust offers from police or the government. They want people to think that this is over now, so go home, take down the barricades, take down the blockades, um, everything's fine now, and that's just not the case. In other words, the exit of the Mounties would be just a starting point. A full resolution, though, somewhere down the road. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Houston, B.C. Now, the RCMP's offer did not quiet solidarity protests in other parts of the country today. In fact, as Salima Shivji shows us, tempers flashed at a rail blockade in Quebec. In Quebec, the patience the federal Liberals have been asking for is quickly running out. I don't care about Trudeau or Legault. The, I just want them to get you out of here safe. A standoff at the edge of a blockade deemed illegal. But this is not measured. This is unacceptable. You're blocking our city. Tension later diffused. Police eventually moved in to serve protesters a court order to leave. A show of force, Quebec's premier says, is justified on non-Indigenous land. As he pushes Ottawa to spell out exactly what it's doing to end the blockade. Mr. Trudeau is saying that he's got a plan, so we would like to know the plan. A demand from all the premiers, strongly communicated in a conference call with the prime minister this evening. So too a sense of frustration, a source says, and a worry counter-protests could escalate. But in Ottawa, Justin Trudeau had little new to say. We're working very hard to end the blockades. Uh, it's an unacceptable situation. 
But the government hopes the RCMP offer to back away from protesters on what Soweton territory will be enough to kickstart that dialogue they keep talking about. We have now met the conditions that were set. I think now the circumstances are such that those barricades should come down. Liberal ministers are delicately pushing for a face-to-face -face meeting with the hereditary chiefs, but the government is avoiding talk of a deadline. We're ready to go at the first indication that they will meet with us. I urge Canadians, I know the pain they're going through, but we ask for, for a little more patience. This has been going on for three weeks. I don't understand why we have to wait on a meeting between uh, you know, a government minister to uphold the rule of law. This is a government that ran on a promise of reconciliation. So the longer this stalemate drags on, the harder it will be to convince the country they can find a way to end it. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Some Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have traveled east to say thank you to supporters in Ontario and Quebec. They are expected to meet with protesters on Tyendinaga Mohawk territory tomorrow. They will also meet with those in Ganawake. Now, you heard that plea for Canadian patience in Salima's story, but hundreds of rail workers have already begun receiving layoff notices and millions of dollars in goods and services are being held up. Peter Armstrong adds it all up. Oh, I like that. That's nice. And we could do this one in this. It's a long way from the rail blockades to this furniture shop in Calgary, but it's already causing something of a squeeze. Our customers are patient for now. Shipments have been delayed and clients are waiting. Our customers are priding themselves on buying Canadian. Uh, right now that's not helping anyone. You can see the cascading impact of the blockades just about everywhere. Ships with cargo that can't get to market, cargo that can't get to the ships in port. It's just stupid. I mean, this has gone on. The, the whole Canadian transportation system has been put into disarray. For 50 years, ships from Andrew Abbott's company have come to the port of Halifax. Now, though, those ships will reroute to the U.S. All the parties have to have their heads knocked together a little bit. Um, you're, you're looking at a situation that you need to get the country operating again. Saskatchewan's potash mining industry depends on rail to get supplies of fertilizer to international markets before planting season. If they don't get that supply from Saskatchewan operations, they will get them from other um, operations throughout the world. In spite of the blockades, many trains are still running and some products are reaching their destination. This is the CP Main Line lumbering through Toronto today. CP makes up nearly half the Canadian rail network and almost all of it is fully operational right now. So consumers haven't had to pay more or go without, at least not yet, but that won't last. Every single business we spoke to today said if this continues much longer, those costs will have to be passed on. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. And it is Thursday, so Rosie will be here later in the hour with the Ad Issue panel. They'll get into the political stakes for this government and whether its strategy is working. That's in about 20 minutes. Well, two weeks of floating quarantine is finally over for some 200 Canadians tonight. Freed from the coronavirus-stricken ship in Japan, they boarded a plane home today. And as Sasha Petrosek reports, many were just at their wits' end. By the time Canadian passengers left the Diamond Princess tonight, they'd renamed it the Floating Jailhouse. A cruise ship under quarantine, they were eager to leave. Some paced the decks one last time. It's really bad. Alan and Diana Chow stayed in their cabin, as they have for two weeks, talking to me by video. Feeling right now is good, so at least we can get out of this place in one piece. Alive. We lost sleep. Many chronicled their exit on social media. The last minute checkup by Canadian medics. The walk out they'd been denied. And we walked down this tunnel and this is the way out to the buses. Delays at the buses as things got organized. Then the half hour drive to Tokyo's Haneda Airport for all those passengers who tested negative for the coronavirus. No fever, no symptoms. Canadians who have the disease were left behind, including 
Retired teacher Craig Lee. His bus took him to hospital eight hours away, where he will be treated until the virus no longer shows in his blood. Almost 50 Canadians remain in Japan with similar infections. Indeed, the Diamond Princess saw an explosion of disease, going from one to more than 600 cases in two weeks. And now it includes two deaths, as the ship became a breeding ground for COVID-19. Experts blame the Japanese government for lax disease control on board. But today, the health minister said everything is appropriate. That was not how the rescued Canadians felt as they finally flew out on a jet chartered by Ottawa in the early hours of the morning. And so, Sasha, can you give us a sense of what those returning Canadians are flying into? Well, Adrian, there's obviously an enormous sense of relief on that flight. After all, they've, in leaving this ship, they've actually left the largest single cluster of coronavirus anywhere outside mainland China. But they've also started a whole new odyssey and a whole new ordeal. They've got two more weeks of quarantine in Cornwall, Ontario, with little contact with friends or family, and a whole bunch of medical exams and tests to prove that there are really no health threat in Canada. Adrian? All right, it's not over yet. Sasha, thanks for this. My pleasure. And while these Canadians go from one quarantine to another, other returnees will soon be free to go home at last. The mandatory 14-day quarantine ends tomorrow for more than 200 people at CFB Trenton. If all goes well, they should be released from their temporary residence at Yukon Lodge, finally ending their long saga that began in Wuhan weeks ago. British Columbia has reported a new case of the coronavirus tonight. We do have a new case of COVID-19 here in British Columbia. This is a, a young woman in, a woman in her 30s. So that brings our total number of cases here in BC to six. So you heard it right there. The patient, a woman uh, in her much, 30s I mean, who recently uh, returned from uh, Iran. Uh, that's a significant uh, development as that country reported a number of cases today. The new Canadian patient, this country's ninth, uh, and a number of her close time, contacts also in public isolation public. now. Now, within China, after days of decline, the number of new infections increased to almost 900. That's more than double yesterday. But as Christine Birak reports, infectious disease experts still think the situation could be stabilizing. Yes, the definition of who's infected keeps changing, and it's not entirely clear how the virus is spreading. But a picture of this outbreak is coming into focus. The data from China continue to show a decline in new uh, confirmed cases. Uh, once again, we're encouraged by this trend. The virus could mutate and the outbreak isn't over yet. But infectious disease experts are beginning to see patterns. Over the past several weeks, there's been a growing appreciation that this infection can cause a uh, more mild illness in a larger proportion of people. A new Chinese study backs up that observation. Researchers looked at medical records from 72,000 patients with COVID-19 in China. They found about 80% of cases were considered mild and just 5% of patients became severely ill. What we're seeing is that the earlier patients are tested and treated, the better they do. About a thousand patients in the Chinese study died. Most of them were over 60. That puts the fatality rate around 2%. Outside of China, estimates put it at less than half a percent. And according to the data, the epidemic likely peaked around January 23rd to the 26th. The massive, massive control efforts that have been imposed by China to get this infection under control may be slowing down this freight train but it could be picking up steam in other parts of the world. There's certainly a lot of interconnectivity between China and many places in Africa. There's already been a confirmed case in Egypt. Public health experts say they need more data sources in order to confirm that the number of cases in China is in fact dropping. But the World Health Organization insists if this outbreak is to be contained, the world must act now. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. And one last note on the coronavirus outbreak tonight. The running tally for total confirmed cases has hit more than 75,000 globally, more than 2,200 of them resulting in death. But we should say the overwhelming majority of cases, 99% of them, are in China, and more than 18,000 people have now recovered.
Political strategist and Donald Trump ally Roger Stone proudly calls himself a dirty trickster. And today a Washington judge agreed, issuing a scathing reprimand along with a prison sentence of 40 months. But as Susan Ormerston tells us now, the wait is on to see what President Trump might do. Roger Stone left the courthouse smiling but silent as protesters and supporters outshouted each other. Pardon Roger Stone, a clear invocation to President Trump to favor his longtime friend and political ally. I'm going to watch it very closely, and at some point I'll make a determination. But Roger Stone and everybody has to be treated fairly. Stone is guilty of lying to congressional investigators and threatening a witness in a bid, said the judge, to cover up for the president. Judge Amy Berman Jackson castigated Stone, saying the truth still exists, the truth still matters. His pride in his own lies are a threat to the very foundation of this democracy. Stone's sentence falls well short, though, of the seven to nine years initially sought by U.S. prosecutors, but overruled by the U.S. Attorney General after a torrent of tweets from the president. I want to thank the Justice Department. They saw the horribleness of a nine-year sentence for doing nothing. You have murderers and drug addicts. They don't get nine years. Four Washington prosecutors quit the case in protest. It's time to stop the tweeting. And Barr, in an extraordinary move, urged the president to stop meddling in ongoing cases. Trump didn't, including today. Roger has a very good chance of exoneration, in my opinion. So, the year-long spectacle, from Stone's arrest in Florida to his sentence in D.C., is not over. His jail term is delayed while his lawyers call for a new trial, supported by Trump, raising tensions further between the president and his attorney general. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. A small city in central Germany is dealing with the aftermath of an enormous horror today. Last night, a shooter with far-right leanings killed nine people. The victims targeted for their ethnicity. And as Margaret Evans tells us, many fear it is part of a rising tide of hate in that country. Candles in Hanau tonight for the victims of what German authorities are calling a racially motivated terrorist attack. Around 10 p.m. local time, a gunman entered a shisha bar and opened fire. The grainy aftermath outside captured on video by a witness. The gunman then drove to another shisha bar and opened fire again. He shot straight at the head of everyone he saw, he's saying. As I was moving to hide, he shot me in the arm. I fell on somebody, somebody fell on me. We became a pile. Police found and stormed the suspected killer's home early this morning, finding his body alongside that of his mother's. Officials identified him as Tobias R., a 43-year-old German, and his video messages, they said, pointed to deeply racist views and absurd conspiracy theories. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel said the attack carried the hallmarks of the far right. Rassismus is a gift. Racism is a poison, she said. Last October, a far-right attacker killed two people in Halle when he tried to storm a synagogue. And in June, a pro-immigration politician was murdered in his garden by an extreme right suspect. Minorities are increasingly worried. Also, geschützt, man kann nicht cafés, One can't protect cafes, mosques, all migrant institutions, says this Kurdish leader in Hanau. But the state has to be more determined in the fight against right-wing extremism. They want more than words and sympathy. Germany, they say, is under threat. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. A violent bank robbery in Ontario was caught on camera. Up next, the surveillance footage and the three very young suspects. In this case, I mean, it's, it's very shocking. What are you really buying when you click purchase online? This packaging actually has a lot of red flags. A CBC Marketplace investigation. 
Amanda Solo during surgery now watched around the world. Do you remember all of this? Nothing, no. Hear what it was like for her and her surgeon. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. A Toronto area bank robbery last night was as brazen as it was brutal. It ended after a panicked chase in a rest in a heist gone wrong with a twist. All three suspects were kids. Ali Chiasson shows us how it went down and how this fits into a frightening pattern. It's just about closing time and everything looks normal until three guys in hoodies run in. A lucky customer leaves before things get violent, while two suspects rough up the tellers. The other walks around with a gun. A woman sitting in her car sees it all and phones 911 from a neighboring business. We were on the scene within minutes thanks to that uh, concerned citizen calling it in. But the suspects were inside long enough to stab two employees and assault two others, including a woman, kicking them in the face when they were down. The suspects fled on foot and they ended up here, hiding out in one of these townhomes under construction. I would say if you were running at full speed, which these guys definitely were, you could get here within about two minutes and the police weren't far behind. We utilized our emergency response unit as well as our canine unit, uh, as well as a helicopter from Durham Regional Police. The injured bank staff are said to be okay. The suspects unnamed. They're young offenders aged 16, 15, and 13. Despite their young ages, um, these are very serious charges that these individuals are facing. Charges include robbery with a firearm and aggravated assault. Are we seeing lots of bank robberies happen in the region? What I can say is we've had more this year in 2020, so only in you know these just January and February, um, than what we've had in an entire year in the past. And the violence is increasing as well. Most of the cases that we've had, you know, the suspects go into the bank, uh, whether they actually obtain money or not, they typically leave without causing any physical injuries to anyone. Um, in this case, I mean, it's, it's very shocking. The bank was closed today. The victims are recovering in hospital. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Markham. Here's some of the other stories we're watching across Canada tonight. The Quebec government says the province will take action to make a stretch of highway near Montreal safer. We will take action rapidly uh, for next summer and prevent these kind of accident and we'll see what we can do. Two people were killed and 60 injured in yesterday's pileup on Montreal's south shore. It involved more than 100 vehicles. Authorities still investigating the cause. Are the license plate plates a problem? Uh, absolutely. Ontario's Conservative government says it will replace tens of thousands of newly issued license plates with what it's calling an enhanced version. This comes amid numerous complaints that the new plates were almost impossible to read in low light. Well, a significant increase in overdose calls has police in Regina warning users of a bad batch of drugs. There's a a great deal of concern for us as a police service looking after um, the health and safety of our community. 69 overdoses have been reported since January 1st. More than 50 of them happened in the last two weeks. Two have been fatal. We have a CBC Marketplace investigation for anyone who shops online. Bottom line, you might want to take a closer look at what arrives in the mail, even if you're using one of the big name stores. Next though, it's Rosie with that issue. Tonight we're going to talk about protests on the ground and pressure in the House. The Liberals say they have a plan to end the standoff, but what if it doesn't work? And where could that leave reconciliation? We'll see you with that issue after the break. Simple question, can the Prime Minister tell us on what day these illegal blockades will come down? What has the Prime Minister done? Has he responded to the invitation? Has he picked up a phone and called? We're working very hard to end the blockades. Uh, it's an unacceptable situation. Everyone wants uh, to take the air out of, the, out of this balloon in the most controlled way. The problem is most people are coming up with us with a pin. 
Pressure is mounting on the federal government, both inside and outside Ottawa. The real blockades and protests in support of the Wet'suwet'en are still ongoing. The political stakes very high. So how is the government handling this crisis? What happens if the strategy fails? It's Thursday, and I'm here with At Issue. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Althea Raj here in Ottawa. And Duncan McHugh joins us tonight in Toronto. Uh, so let's start with how we think the federal government is doing so far and whether we we are sort of nearing the end of, of how far they can let this go. Chantal, let's start with you. Uh, nearing the end of how far they can let this go, yes, probably. I don't think that uh, <laughs> there is uh, enough patience out there uh, for us to be doing this same time next week. Yeah. yeah. Put it this way. How they've been doing? Well, the federal government came late to showing up uh, to say we're aware that something is happening. They've been playing catch-up uh, on the front of uh, what they're trying to do about it. They have uh, obviously, I think, by most accounts, totally uh, miscalculated uh, the prime minister's first public intervention, which fell below the mark of where people were at. Uh, and beyond that, uh, they still uh, are trying to move this forward. And I think there is still quite a lot of support majority support in the House of Commons mm -hmm. for trying to negotiate a way out of this impasse. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, do you agree with the general way they're approaching it, which seems to be, you know, having conversations, much of it behind the scenes that we're not privy to, some of it where they're bringing in opposition parties and premiers to try and get a, a, a handle on how this moves forward? I think it is the least bad option of the ones that we've heard being canvassed. Look, there's a real potential for this thing to spin out of control. Uh, both in the short term and doing much more lasting damage in the long term. Uh, it is, behooves everybody to be conscious of that, mm -hmm. that the dangers of intervention, a, a pre premature, a hasty intervention, I mean, there may be a position at the point way down the road when you have no alternative, but only after you've canvassed all the other possibilities. And so people who are demanding that they intervene now or yesterday, uh, I don't think are paying proper attention to the um, um, explosiveness of the situation that, that they're dealing with here. Mm -hmm. So yes, it makes the government look hamstrung, what have you, to have to deal with this, but that's the nature of the situation. We have to stop this kind of magical thinking that um, these kinds of complicated problems can be solved by just, you know, issuing orders and greater enforcement. It's, yeah. it's just way more complicated than that. Well, and, and also, surely, Althea, the, the history has, has taught us that lesson time and again. So, you, you know, you just have to look at that to see that that's probably not the way to go. Yeah, I mean, I think the government uh, rightly believes that this could be a powder keg, and so it needs to take its time uh, to uh, reflect on how best to handle the situation. And for now, it's been trying to let Indigenous communities know that they're willing to talk. But um, I agree with Chantal. I think the government actually totally misunderstood what was happening. Either they got they were badly briefed or they misread or misunderstood what they were being told. Um, initially, the government's response and the prime minister's response in Senegal was, well, you know, we're a rule of law country. The, the law must be abided by. And this basically is a BC issue. It's a pipeline that's entirely within British Columbian territory. It seems to be a family feud between different community members. There is no ask of the federal government. And I think that no ask of the federal government is still actually the case. And that's where the government's role becomes more complicated because they're not really sure what their role should be, sure. aside from the fact of like, well, getting the trains running and the port reopened. Okay, let me let me bring in Duncan. How, how much should we expect to hear, though? Do you think, Duncan, from a government that is having conversations in BC, in in Tyendinaga, trying to get this sorted out between different groups? How, how much should they really be putting out in the public domain? What we are not hearing is, I mean, to, to suggest that they came late to the conversation. I mean, yes, we've seen ministers. Uh, being spread out across the country this week, finally. But what we're not hearing is discussion about some of the broader plans that the government had proposed in its earlier uh, mandate. I mean, they talked about an Indigenous rights framework, which should have been the set out a, a blueprint for resolving these kinds of disputes in traditional territories. We haven't heard the Prime Minister talk about that. We haven't heard the Prime Minister reaffirm 
uh, you know, when they're going to be introducing a United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples legislation, as we have seen in British Columbia. So we haven't seen any of the broad approaches that this government has used flowery rhetoric to say that they, they affirm, but but we're not seeing those those being laid out right now. Well, they, they were going to table UNDRIP this week, and then they had to, to put it off because they felt that it was going to be drowned out by by what was happening. And they say that they they fully intend to do that. So, but I, I take your point that they're not talking about. The, the bigger issues that lie underneath all of this. Can, can we just turn our minds first uh, quickly to, to the opposition's response, though, because it too has been uh, particular, and I mean the official opposition here, the Conservatives. Have a listen to a little bit of what Andrew Shear said today in the House. These anti-free market, anti-energy activists have nothing to do with reconciliation. Right. Okay, so that's one example, but Peter McKay, Aaron O'Toole, other leadership contenders have all said uh, things like this and 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 very different. In fact, Peter McKay using the word thugs to describe some of the protesters. Duncan, I'll get you to weigh in first on this. What do you make of the way the Conservatives in particular are approaching this? As though this is, is I don't know, as though it's a protest being taken over by outside forces only. Uh, let's deal with, with Peter McKay's tweet first, which uh, ultimately he deleted, uh, you know, which is puzzling from a, from a <laughs> the, the, the contender, the, the leading contender for yeah. the Conservative Party leadership, but, but the dealing with, you know, his wording, thugs and things like that, I mean, it's, it's, it's strange that a former justice minister would not be familiar with the Ipperwash inquiry and the results of, of that inquiry, which clearly suggested that police are, need to play, uh, you know, a peacekeeping role and, and that, that uh, going into a community uh, and, and a blockade and, and taking it down with police force is not the way to find a resolution to these issues. It's, it's puzzling to me that, that he would, that Mr. McKay would be suggesting that, that there seems to be a, a role for, for, for vigilantism in, in this country. Uh, and and that, that's, you know, concerning in terms of uh, no one wants to see another Dudley George. Yeah. Uh, who was the who was the activist the protester killed in, in that inquiry uh, Andrew what do, you, what do you make of the way the conservatives are positioning themselves on that well I mean it's unfortunate this is happening in the middle of a conservative leadership race where they're each trying to one-up each other in terms of their ability to play to the base you know it, it, it there may be elements of truth in what they're saying but it matters how and when you say it you don't have to bark out everything that happens to be on your mind just because it appeals to a particular uh, segment of your of your uh, electorate um, Yes, there are probably people who have piggybacked on this uh, um, crisis to push their own agendas. That often happens. Uh, yes, the, I think the the issue was certainly initially widely misunderstood uh, about you know what exactly was the source of the conflict here. Mm -hmm. um, but the role of leaders, it seems to me, in a crisis like this, is to try to bring people together and to try to calm tempers down rather than inflaming them. Ch Chantal, what, what do you make of the way they've handled it and I guess the way that the, 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 the government sort of boxed the Conservatives out of, of, of the conversation by, you know, saying that they couldn't even come to a meeting to talk about things? Uh, I did not think that it was the greatest <laughs> liberal moment to freeze the Conservatives out of uh, the leaders' meeting uh, yeah. and I thought it betrayed uh, if not panic, at least uh, a lack of confidence uh, of the government in itself. That's one. I have found this week uh, that uh, Mr. Scheer, again, has failed to rise above partisanship to be constructive and to offer constructive solutions. And I, I you know, this is someone who came close to being prime minister. And I, I think we're probably better off for not having someone who would have sent in the police on Monday morning to uh, try to resolve this issue because we would be in a larger crisis. And I was stunned uh, by uh, the questions uh, that are begged about Peter McKay's judgment when I saw the tweet about uh, saying yay for a group of citizens taking the law in their own hands to dismantle barricades because a former justice minister should actually know better. Uh, okay, Althea, you, you weigh in on, on, on where we are then <laughs> with, with the way people are positioning themselves and, and how this, you know, if, 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 as I started this out, as whether we're at near the end of this. I think that the, the scary part uh, for the government and for Indigenous communities and Indigenous leaders, and they recognize this, is what this will mean for reconciliation. I think the Liberal government uh, spent a lot of time talking about building the nation-to-nation -nation relationship and bringing Canadian society on side. 
but now that you have 1,500 people possibly getting pink slips, some hopefully just temporarily, um, that that may poison the well for reconciliation, and that is a risk that weighs on the government's mind as well as Indigenous leaders. Uh, I'll, uh, last point of that on that to you there, Duncan. Well, it, I mean, the Prime Minister has spoken about this being a, a country that's, that's governed by the rule of law. He'd be do, do well to remember the words of the, the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada and the Delgamook decision of 1997. His final words were, we're all here to stay, when he told the governments of the day that it, it was better to negotiate these issues. It was better to negotiate with the Wet'suwet'en and hereditary chiefs with regard to Aboriginal title than it is to go repeatedly back to court. So if, if, if we're talking about reconciliation, then one would hope that this is a reminder that these are important uh, long-term discussions and dialogue that needs to go on and, and that it does produce results. We are not talking to, about the other big deal that happened this week, which was among, amongst the Northern Cree, who announced a $4.9 yeah. billion yeah. Dollar deal with the provincial government for a deep sea port for rail lines. There are, when discussions and dialogue happens, uh, First Nations across the country have shown that they want to, to sit down and have a productive uh, future for their people. Okay, thank you all very much. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to Add Issue the Podcast for extra content. That's where I'll get my extra time. This week we'll continue this conversation and talk about the potential impact on future energy projects. Look for this on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. For now, though, it's back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. All right, up next, CBC's Marketplace goes online shopping. Apple AirPods on Amazon for $245. Are you getting the real deal when you click buy? We'll show you what they found next. And the surgical assist watched around the world. We talked to the patient who used her own music to help guide her doctor. Can you trust what you buy from the biggest online sites? A marketplace investigation found not always, even when the seller, platform, or price seem legitimate. As Asha Tomlinson found out, it's a point brought home in tests of dozens of products. Do you shop online? Yes, I do. When you get the products, do you believe that they're real? Of course. <laughs> Why? Because I bought it like from Walmart or some Amazon. Nearly 84% of Canadians shop online. So we wanted to find out if the sites we're shopping on deliver the real deal, or could we be buying counterfeit? Apple AirPods on Amazon for $245. Nike Air Jordan Clutch, 85 US. Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Wish, and AliExpress were put to the test. Dozens of products in different categories, including makeup. Three experts weighed in and they checked out these Kylie Jenner lip products. This packaging actually has a lot of red flags that would be brought to Kylie Cosmetics' attention, and Kylie is actually spelt wrong. It says, Kylie Lip Kits by Kylie, K-Y-I-L-E. They suspected the Kylie products from every retailer were fake, except Wish. They weren't available on that site. But could they be dangerous, too? We sent them off to a lab to test for toxic ingredients like mercury and lead. The results? Mercury can have adverse effects on the nervous system. Toxicologist Chris Prosser confirmed there's mercury in these lip products from AliExpress, double the amount accepted by Health Canada. The fact that it's being applied to the lips um, and that likely percentage of that is being ingested, that's a definite pathway of exposure that I would be concerned about. Then there's this MAC lipstick, also counterfeit and bought on AliExpress. The lead in this lipstick, over 750 times Health Canada's limit. The takeaway from the data you have here is be careful where you buy it from. AliExpress banned the sellers from their platform after we contacted them. We ask all five retailers to come on camera to explain how they're cracking down on counterfeit products. They all say no but tell us they're committed to stopping the sale of counterfeit products on their site using a combination of the latest technology and enforcement to protect consumers. And they all add if what you buy isn't as advertised, you can always request a refund. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto.
And you can see more of that investigation on this week's Marketplace. That's tomorrow night on CBC Television and CBC Gem at 8 o'clock, 8.30 in Newfoundland. And up next, a brain tumor, a challenge, and a violin solo in the OR. Last night, we showed you this incredible video. Well, tonight, we get the story behind the surgery, right from the patient and the doctor. Next. Hi, I'm Rosemary Barton. And I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. And we are the hosts of Party Lines. We will drop a new episode every Thursday, and we will talk about the biggest political stories of the week. So subscribe to Party Lines, available on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as civilians are forced to flee airstrikes and shelling, an up close look at the horrors unfolding in the Syrian province of Idlib. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Last night, we told you about a performance that became a viral sensation. A musician playing her instrument with a piece of her skull removed, her brain exposed as doctors worked on it to remove a tumor. Well, tonight, Briar Stewart caught up with the woman in that video and has her tale of guiding a scalpel with a violin. Dagmar Turner has spent years developing the precise and speedy movements required to play the violin. She's part of the orchestra on Britain's Isle of Wight, but last month delivered a most unlikely solo in an operating room in London, serenading surgeons while they carefully worked to remove a tumor from her brain. <laughs> Fantastic. The video of the operation has been widely shared, but she's barely seen it. Do you remember all of this? Nothing, no. Doctors had asked if she wanted to be awake during surgery. The practice has become more common as it allows surgeons to monitor movement and speech, helping to prevent inadvertent damage to parts of the brain that control motor function. It was clearly the most promising um, method to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Quality of life and good quality of life for me means to be able to play the violin. Surgeons have operated on patients before as they've played instruments. It was even part of an episode of Grey's Anatomy. Turner had seen a video online, which is why she suggested bringing her violin. So she put the challenge and said, look, what if I play the violin so you can ensure that my ability to do so continues? And when a patient throws you a challenge like that, as a surgeon, we've got to be creative and find a way of doing this. Dr. Kiyomars Ashkan understood her passion. He holds a music degree alongside his medical one and the team planned the surgery to accommodate her music. We wanted her to wake up in a position that she could already handle a violin and start playing. The bow was another issue. I kept poking somebody in my way over the bow, because it's a team effort. Well, he needed to really give me the space to pull that bow through, and I needed to give him the space to take the tumor out. The doctors told her they were able to remove 95% of it, a huge relief alongside the joy that comes with her ability to keep playing. Briar Stewart, CBC News, on the Isle of Wight. That is a heck of a story. Can we watch that again? No, no. I, <laughs> we'll be right back with the moment. Tonight, it's a tribute to a man who changed the very way we work. You may not recognize his face, but I guarantee he made your life a whole lot easier. We'll be right back. Cut, copy, paste. Sound familiar? It's something you probably do on your computer every day without even really thinking about it. And this man right here, Larry Tesler, is the man behind it all. He passed away this week at the age of 74, but his work is being remembered by everyone. That's our moment. Larry Tesler was a computer scientist. Instead of words on the screen where you had to manually type everything out, he was the, the father of cut, copy, paste. Prior to Larry Tesler's work, you had to like have a degree in computer engineering just to use a PC. 
Well, I can't imagine doing any type of work without it. It allows us to do word processing, to sure, create documents so. and articles and write books. Larry probably didn't understand the significance of his work, and people probably didn't know the name Larry Tesler unless you were in the tech space. The history of what Larry Tesler did, it was all about making personal computing that much easier. And so he contributed things like this that really we take for granted today. We totally take for granted. Yeah. We, owe this, we owe this man a ton. Uh, it's, the story <laughs> is that he, Larry worked at Xerox uh, in the 70s, working on you know cut, copy, paste, based on the old school, literally cut, copy, and paste with glue. And he wasn't doing anything with it until a man by the name of Steve Jobs came along and said, <laughs> you, sir, are sitting right. on a gold mine. Come work for me. And, and I always wonder if people in the moment realize what their little innovation, their little thing that they contributed, just how far that would spiral out. It took Steve Jobs to tell wow. him. Amazing. Uh, that's The National for this February 20th. Have a good night. Good night.